everybody, and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg, and it's the best dead gum garden show on the radio. And we're excited to have you with us, whether you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, or listening to us via podcast. We've got a great show planned for you. As always, we're going to have our show and tell segment at the beginning. We're going to talk a little integrated pest management today, and then, as always, answer some of your questions at the end. So we've got a bit of a cool spell coming in that's kind of last little cool spell for the year, we hope. It's kind of put my planting at a halt. I know some of our neighbors to the north, even the northern part of the state, uh, are a little bit nervous because they got excited and planted early. Uh, it was supposed to only get done 39 here. I checked this morning and said 36. Yeah, the biggest thing at that is going to be frost. I thought it would be okay. I talked to a guy yesterday, his corn was up. I said, I think you're going to be okay on corn. Now, I've seen it get bit a little bit at that if you have a heavy frost. It's all according to what kind of frost you have at those temperatures there. For the most part, you'll be all right on everything. That fellow across the road, he's probably hoping his pepper's going to be all right too. Yeah, and he probably will. He probably will. It's, it's borderline, but it's close. 36, yeah, yeah. Just depends on how much moisture's in the air, whether we actually get a frost or not. Yeah, now folks up in north there, it's going to get down in the 20s and stuff. You're probably wishing you'd waited a week or two to plant your stuff. So it happens. It's part of gardening. Every year we're going to have that last little cool spell, and we think this is it for the year. Yeah, hopefully if you're uh, in trouble as far as how cold it's going to get, you've got some replacement uh, backup transplants. That's why I always plant more than I'm going to need because it's always good to have some backups. Uh, you know, frost, anything could happen. Yeah, and if you've got 10 tomato plants, some like that, or pepper plants you're worried about, put your little bucket on them just for insurance purposes, whatever you got, to keep the frost off of them, if you don't have many. So last week, we went with a new camera setup. We didn't really mention it because we weren't quite sure. It was just kind of a test run last week, and it turned out pretty good. Yeah. And um, so this is going to be our, our new setup for the foreseeable future. It is going to take us a little while to get used to it. We're working with three cameras here, and it's like almost like a, boom, a boom, new boom, studio. Boom, 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 boom. So making sure we look at the right camera at the right time, it's a little tricky. So just bear with us as we uh, get it all together and, and uh, also working with some new audio equipment, trying to fine-tune all that, but we will get there. Yep. I want to talk about these container tomatoes. Now we're always known for our big in-ground gardens, but I'm trying a little container gardening this year. And this little guy right here has been growing fast. I mean fast. You can see how thick the uh, stem on it is, nice and healthy. I went, to, uh, I went to the big blue box store and just bought me a little hanging pot here, a couple dollars. And we have this series, we just completed it by adding the third variety. We have a series on our site called the Little Birdie Series. Now that's what the breeder calls it. You won't find that word if you look for it on our site. But there's three varieties there. There's one called Yellow Canary, which is obviously a yellow tomato. There's one called Rosy Finch, which is what I got right here. And another one called Red Robin, which I'll show you in a little bit. So the Rosy Finch is a more kind of pinkish uh, type. That's the one I've got planted also. These are dwarf determinant cherry tomatoes is, is what they're characterized as. So these are only supposed to get about eight to 12 inches tall. Yeah, and I can already tell it. I mean, you put them beside a regular tomato, there's already a huge difference in the size of the plant. So these are gonna be really compact plants that's gonna do well on those patios. You all that's got those little small patios, apartments, whatever, and you wanna grow your tomato or two, this is gonna be your series to go with right here. Yep, so eight to 12 inches tall, no need to trellis these guys, and um, just supposed to make loads of cherry tomatoes. Even if mine kind of fall over the side here, I think it'd be just fine. You can see there, we've got- uh, Got some blooms got already. Got some blooms yep. on them already. Nice and green, you've done a good job fertilizing them. What I did, I just bought some, just standard bag of pot mix. Now I mix, I put it in a bucket, and I mix some of our complete organic fertilizer in there with them, and uh, it is popped. It is yep. growing fast. Yep. And, and like you said, with the transplants, even in the four inch pots, these things wasn't about this tall. They were bushy, and then compared to my better boys, which were yeah. on up eight inches or so. So very compact. And even if you got, heck, I got a 20 by 60 plot of tomatoes, but having this right outside the back door, uh, kids enjoy it. You know, no trellising, no real maintenance required, no pruning. You just, you know, keep it watered, keep it fed a little bit. and. Um, 
it, it's hard to hard to be easier. It doesn't get much easier. That's than that. right. That's right. Um, so I'm excited about these and excited about my little um, soiree into container gardening. Yep. And raised beds too. If you had a raised, raised bed, raised beds are wonderful for that because you know you don't have to work. A lot of times we have trouble trellising in a raised bed, but with those you don't have to worry about it. Nope. What else we got here? Oh, speaking of tomatoes, I want to show everybody these transplants here and talk about these for a minute. So we carry, uh, do we carry, yeah, we do carry big beef. So we carry big beef, celebrity, and better boy. Uh, we added those this year and those are all grown by the same breeder. And I was talking to the breeder and he said, those are great varieties. A lot of people like them, but some, some, Areas people have trouble growing them because they're not as virus resistant as something like a Bella Rosa or Red Snapper. So what they have done is they have created some tomato spotted wilt virus resistant versions of these very popular varieties. So it's the same celebrity, same better boy, same big beef, but they added TSWV. Is that right? Tomato Sounds spotted. good to me. Uh, resistance to them. Now these aren't available to the public yet. We just got some sample seeds in. They want us to try them out. And what they're trying to see is if seed companies like ourselves will carry just the new, what they're going to call Celebrity Plus version, or the old version, or both, or basically how it's going to work. Now, I'm going to do my own little trial, but Danny wanted at Deep South. They love Celebrity. That's I it. believe I got me a, a tray of the big boys planted on Of the big boys with that same? It was Better Boy and Big Beef. Big beef, I think, is what I got okay. planted. There was a few seeds left over, and I planted me some in the tray. They just coming up. So I, um, Danny and Juan at Deep South Homestead, they love the celebrity. So I sent them some seeds because I said, you know, you guys know what this is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to grow. Y'all can give it a better comparison to me. I haven't grown celebrity a whole lot. And then Better Boy, our buddy Jimbo over there in Texas swears by Better Boy. And so I... Um, I sent him some Better Boy Plus seeds so he could do a little comparison there. And uh, hopefully uh, it turns out well. And if it does, we'll, we'll carry these Plus varieties. I'm not sure when exactly they're going to be available on the market. Probably will be late this year, early next year. But they are in production, and uh, it's, it's going to give some people some options to grow these virus-resistant versions these really popular varieties. You know, I was just noticing in the greenhouse the other day, because this is that time of year where the greenhouse is loaded up, and we have got all sorts of kind of tomatoes growing out there. Man, the choices are just about endless when you come to tomatoes. We have got, I don't know how many varieties, but it is mind boggling when you go out there and start looking and trying to figure out exactly what you want to plant or who you want to give these or give these to. It's unbelievable at the choices of tomatoes out there. And it's come a long way on tomato breeding in the last few years as they have worked with these disease resistant varieties to make them better. You know, taste is a big thing now where back in the day it was not. So uh, tomato varieties have come a long way and we're excited about trying some of these new ones this year. Jolene is one I'm trying. Yeah, Joe, I got some Jolene's that are almost ready in the greenhouse. And, and like you said, the, these newer developments, they're not sacrificing taste like they were in say maybe the late 90s, early 2000s. They're, they're keeping the taste even uh, there's a gene called the crimson gene. A lot of them are being introduced yep. to give it that dark red color. So always exciting new things coming on the horizon with tomatoes. Oh, one more thing, or a couple more things. So know how you tell when your onion's ready to harvest? When they walk, flip over. Yep, so that guy right there, I was out there in the garden just earlier before I come over here to shoot the show and saw that one out there. That's the first one I've seen fall over. This is a variety called Sweet Agent that we just added, and I had read a lot of good things about trials that universities have done with this variety, and I'd also heard that this was an earlier variety, so it's going to grow out a little quicker than some of the other ones. It's actually kind of caught up with my plethora, and uh, this was the first one I noticed that had fell over, and that's a good, that's what I'm going for right there. Nice big old white onion. Man, it's white. Yep. Some folks may grow a bigger onion than that, but if I grow onion that size, I'm happy with that. So um, I haven't got complete conclusive results from my onion trial, but I will tell you I'm real happy with plethora so far and real happy with the sweet agent so far. I'm not happy with mine at all. I've, I've had a bad onion year. 
Bad what variety day. did you grow? Do you remember? Oh, it doesn't matter. I got two or three up there. I got two of them. That I know I, I tried a new variety that we don't carry that they sent me to trial out called Fox, but they didn't. Disease pressure. Wetness, disease pressure, just kicked my tail. And I can't remember the last time I've had this much trouble. But we just had an unusual amount of, of, of rain, and for some reason or other, it just didn't work well with me here. Been a while since you got skunked on that. It has, it has. It's, it's painful, but I'm dealing with it. So I want to talk about my uh, my no-till experimental plot real quick, and um, and some of the uh, no-till folks out there. Before I get into that, I just picked up a load of compost to put on my no-till, and you wanted to mention something about oh yeah that. So this is for you local people. Well, if I can get that up here, the folks we get our compost from are now bagging it. So I don't know what kind of distribution channel they got, but if you're locally within, say, 50 to 75 miles of where we live, they are bagging this now. If you just need a few bags, you can come over and call them and get it, and we'll put a link there somewhere with their phone number on there. Yeah, one with their phone number. I don't know if they have a website. But yeah, yeah. for instance, if you don't got a truck or a trailer where you can get a big load of it and you just want a little bit, they got it in bags now um, so you can... You can go get your bag up. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah, he came out and spent an hour or so with him the other day, and we talked shop and brought him this bag. Wanted me to mention on the show, and I told him I would. So it's great stuff. Lennox, Georgia. Lennox, uh, Georgia. It's, it's called the Cotton Gin, but if you Google Lennox Cotton Gin, you'll find it's right off Interstate 75. Yep. So pretty easy to get to if you're Tifton, Valdosta, anywhere in that area, uh, right by the interstate there in the big town of Lenox, Georgia. Just make sure you- A1 call. compost, it's really good stuff. Just make sure you call them before you go over there because they knock off at three on the dot. Uh, Sometimes they'll lock off more than that. It'll take a two hour lunch. It's a cotton gin and they just busy during cotton gin and season. Other times of year, they kind of take it easy. So. Uh, yeah, call them before you drive over yeah. there. Uh, make sure they there and, and they got it bagged up for you. So speaking of that, so I got four tons of it the other day and I'm putting on my no-till plot, uh, just coating it with compost again and we're just going to keep this experiment going. And uh, I, I like to joke about some of the no-till proponents out there because they can be a little bit, um, a little aggressive and they can be a little bit dogmatic about their philosophies. Well, know? not only is it about no-till, but it's also about, I mean, organic, non-organic. It's about GMO, non-GMO. It's about politics. So a lot of people this day and time, to me it seems like more than ever, are really opinionated, opinionated and really have a strong feeling one way or the other. But you know, most of the time, the truth lies somewhere there in the middle. That's right. So I'm a member, I don't post a lot in there anymore because I'm not market farmer anymore, but I'm still a member of several market farming groups on Facebook. And a guy uh, posted a picture the other day on there and this was not a picture of his farm. He was asking about how he could plant garlic so it'd be easier to get in there and cultivate with his walking tractor. See, he just posted a picture of some other guy's garlic farm, and you could tell the soil had been cultivated. Well, this one guy, younger guy, jumps on there, and boy, he just starts going after him about that, that tilled, cultivated soil, you're doing things all wrong, all this, and, and it just went on, and I, I got a kick out of reading it. Turns out this guy don't even really have a big farm. He had what he called a micro farm in some suburban area. So he didn't even really farm. And here he was telling this other guy how to grow his garlic and telling him how he was a bad person because he was planning on cultivating his garlic. And it just got me thinking, man, why? I understand these people are passionate, but I don't understand why they got to be so aggressive. This guy had, if you kept reading the comments, he had just graduated school with a geology degree. You know, he, he knew everything. Yeah. I don't know why you, you don't you don't you rarely see the flip side of that where you have somebody that does it more kind of old school traditional way going and telling an organic grower or a no-till farmer that they're doing it all wrong. It's always the the new style coming in and saying if you don't do it this way you're destroying the earth all this stuff. Well with the experience comes wisdom and with wisdom we come to realize there's more than one way to skin a cat. Mm -hmm. Not that I've ever skinned a cat. There's more than one, one, one way if you wanted to. Right and I know there's some friendly uh, no-till growers out there. We've got a lot of them that watch our show but um, it's folks like that that, that cause me to want to joke around about it a little bit and um, talk about the no-till Kool-Aid. What else we got going on? We got some new varieties. How about that? 
new varieties and a few new products. Let's talk about a couple of new products real quick. And we're going to mention some of these as we go through our pest control thing. So we got a few new products in here. Um, I'll let you talk about them there. You want to go with that one first? Yeah, so this is a, uh, a spreader sticker, you might say, that we got in here. And this is a product I have used, or a similar product I have used for years and years and years. Now, if you've ever sprayed a vegetable leaf or something like that, and you notice that the water kind of beat it up on it. Cabbage. A lot, yeah, cabbage called onions. Onions are notorious for it. A lot of your your vegetables have a waxy buildup on that leaf. And what happens when you spray a water droplet on it, it beads up and it doesn't spread out. Well, this right here is to add in with any chemicals. You can add it in with synthetics or organics. Except oil-based. Except oil-based, you gotta be a little careful there. But now in copper, you gotta be a little careful there, but you can use the copper tox, not copper tox. What's the name of our product? It's liquid copper. Liquid copper tox. We used to treat goat feet with copper tox. Anyway, uh, you, your copper products, you have to be a little careful there, but you can mix them in. Where it's really beneficial at is with insecticides and with fungicides, probably fungicides more so than insecticides, because it causes that that droplet when it hits the leaf to spread out and to cover. So it's a huge benefit on certain applications. Uh, treating onions with a fungicide, it's almost a necessity. Cabbage collards and other things too, it helps a lot. Anything with a waxy leaf. Yeah, anything like that you can use. Uh, it's pretty safe to use. You don't have to worry about burning. Uh, the oil products are going to be, maybe it heats those up a little bit, but besides that, you don't have any problems as far yeah, as They burning. do recommend not using it with things like neem oil or hort oil because it almost makes it stick too good. Well, it has to, the yeah, they have the same. You wouldn't want to use it with hort oil because it does the same thing. Right. So, uh, so we got that on our site as, I think we call it Ultra 90 Surfactant. Then we added a new fungicide. So. A couple of these products that we've added, we have a, a great line of organic, all natural products, but we have a lot of customers who aren't strictly organic and wanted us to carry some synthetic, uh, more conventional products. Um, and, and the big difference in organic versus conventional is um, organic is, is you know considered a, a little less toxic uh, to some people, but the main thing is organic, you have to spray more frequently. With some of these more conventional ones, you're not having to apply as frequently. Yeah, it's prime example is this baby right here. So this right here is a synthetic pyrethroid. Now it has the same makeup or what it was, it was modeled after pyrethrum, but the difference in this is it has a residual to it. So it has the same mode of action that our py uh, pyrethrin, yeah, pyrethrin, mm -hmm. pyrethrin is, but it is considered a pyrethroid, so it is synthetic. A pyrethrin will kill on contact, and this one will too, but this one has a residual up to seven to 14 days after you spray it, so it will stay there and keep on working. Now, I don't necessarily recommend using this as your first line of defense. You can use some of these organic results of neem, pyrethrin. You can use some of those to get uh, control when you don't have a very bad problem. But this is when you get a bad problem and you're fixing to lose your crop and you got to do something, you want to turn to this one right here. I believe the retreat on this is every seven days. And one of the things that everybody always worries about, well, how often, how long do I have to wait after I apply it? to what I can harvest. Well, on tomatoes, this one's one day. Yeah, it varies from crop to crop. And, and on the product page for this Bug Buster 2, I've got a comprehensive list yep. that shows you the the how long you have to wait. Because with most of the organic products, you can harvest day after spraying right. or day of spraying. With these, you have to wait a little longer, yep. or it's recommended to wait a little longer. Sweet corn, this works really good on earworm, on sweet corn, one day withdrawal. You have to wait one day before you can harvest. Squash is three days. Eggplant, seven days, which is kind of unusual there, but that's one of the longer ones was, uh, was eggplants. It's a great product. Also works really good on ants. So uh, of all the pyrethroids, it is, and there's several of them out there, it's probably my favorite one. Yeah, and the good thing is you don't, you know, you, you have that choice. You can use just the organic problem, products, or if you have a severe problem, you can use this. Nobody's making you use either one. 
That's your choice. We yeah, got just, both options. It just gives you an option where, the, in case you're in that situation where you've got to do something other. Now, uh, this one right here is fairly inexpensive. I think it's one ounce per gallon is the mix yeah. rate on it's that. It's actually cheaper than the organic version of it. Right. Um, so there you have it. And then we have a, a conventional fungicide too here we added. You want to talk about that one a minute? Well, I will. Yep. So it's a, it's a, uh, what that one is, is a, I caught you. I ain't got my glasses on. Right. Though. <laughs> That's a, that is a systemic, uh, fungicide there. Uh, so whereas the other ones are more kind of contact, that's a systemic fungicide that's going to be a little more comprehensive, require a little less frequent applications and say something about liquid copper or disease control. Yeah. And you would use this for what? You would use it for anything. Your mildews, um, you know, anthracnose. Fungamax. Now this would be also be a good product that you would mix in with that the brants or fat it down there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. <coughs> Last thing, new varieties, which we're almost done adding new varieties. So just a few more here. I talked about this one a minute ago. This is the red robin tomato. This is the red cherry version of that container one I showed you earlier. Uh, if you got three hanging baskets, it'd be cool to have one of each. Um, we might in the future do a little uh, mixture of these. That might not be a bad idea, but we have them individually now. This one, the other two I have in 10 seed pack options. This one I don't yet, just a 50 seed pack option, but uh, we hope to get a 10 seed pack option of that in the next few weeks or so. The other one here, uh, so I have a little thing with pepper varieties. I go crazy with different varieties of peppers. Also have this thing with pumpkins. I've noticed that. Uh, pumpkins and winter squash, I have a little bit of a thing. So I've uh, been trying to get this variety for a while. We just got it. This is a flat white pumpkin. We added the flat so pumpkin, the orange one. And for some reason, these things just sell really well. The flatter pumpkins, any kind of unique shaped pumpkin does really well. This one has powdery mildew resistance. So um, you can, you know, get away with probably growing it in the summer for a fall harvest. And um, just makes about a 12 inch diameter flat pumpkin, 10 pounds or so. And a lot of people like to stack these things for displays. It's also really good to eat as well. All right. So today we're going to talk about pests. And we're not going to cover every single pest, garden pest out there. But my goal with today's show was to give you an idea of the kind of mindset and philosophy you need to have if you've got a consistent problem with a single pest on a, a particular crop. So what we're going to be talking about today is, is called Integrated Pest Management, also IPM. Which is a buzzword that's been around for a long time, and that's just basically using different tools to control your pest in your garden. By definition, they say IPM is an ecosystem-based strategy for long-term pest management, which includes things like biological controls, habitat manipulation, resistant varieties, lots of different things. Traps. Right. So things you can do to keep you from having to spray so much, basically. Um, and and kind of understanding the biology of the pest is going to help you understand how to prevent it or reduce its impact on your crop. In a true IPM program, you would also mo uh, monitor your population levels and know where your thresholds are that you would start an application or not to. That's right. So I just picked four or five here of common garden pests. And hopefully as we work through this, you can understand, okay, this is how I need to go about it. And then you can go online and you can just research, just type in the pest name, earwig, IPM, or earwig integrated pest management. And you'll see lots of different studies from universities pop up and you can kind of compile that information from yourself. Cause some of this is geographic specific. And you picked some of the toughest insects to control. Did you do that on purpose? I tried to. I tried to. It was tough narrowing down. I started out with a list of about 10 and I said, well, shoot, that'll take us two hours to go through that. So I did narrow it down to four or five. The first one we're going to talk about is called squash vine borer. Okay. And this and it is, does exactly what the name suggests. So we'll throw up a picture on the screen there of what the adult looks like. The adult is called a clear wing moth and it's got some orange on it. Uh, pretty easy to identify the adult. But the adult is not what does the damage. It's the larva or the little caterpillars that do the damage. 
So these moths lay eggs. They come out of the woodworks. They lay eggs. Those eggs hatch in 10 to 15 days. And then those larvae form and they start boring into the stems, mainly on your squash. Yeah, if you've ever seen one, you know it bores in there and it kind of goes up and it just eats the inner sides of that wall out and just makes yourself a nice happy home in there. And they do a lot of damage, pretty much kills the plant or kills off part of the plant. So we'll throw up a picture of the little worm of the larva eating it there. And so it doesn't necessarily take down the whole plant at once. It's just going to damage the vascular tissue of wherever it's boring into there. And you'll see that branch or um, stem there die. And I'd eventually get the whole plant if you've got a bad problem. So this, these are pretty problematic. I don't have as much of an issue with these as a lot of other people do. But I feel like on our videos and stuff, this is the one people ask about the most. This, how do I manage squash vine borer? And one thing that makes it nearly impossible to control with a pesticide application is, is once that nymph gets inside of that stem, whatever you spray is not going to get on them. So they can be difficult from that perspective to treat at certain times. So we're going to go through a few treatment or IPM strategies you can use here. And you'll see a common theme uh, almost with all of these as far as what you need to do to kind of reduce the populations. Eradication is not the goal for most of these because it? it's just not possible. Uh, the but key word would be control. Manage, control, control or management is what we're going through here. So with these guys, as with any you know, disease or insect that can overwinter in the soil, you can make sure you remove any old crop debris. Um, you can also till to reduce the overwintering impact. So if you live in an area where these things can overwinter in the soil, the eggs are there and next, when it warms up, those eggs hatch, you get the adults, they start laying eggs, that's when you get problems. So boom, boom. I know a lot of people are against tillage, but to reduce egg overwintering impact, it does actually help to cultivate every Yeah, and I'll tell you something, there's really not a lot of documentation there on, but I think cover crops helps with that one too. It helps spruce that cycle. I think it does too. Um, another thing with these guys, and this may be, why, may be why we don't have a big of issue is, they recommend succession planting to miss the egg laying window here. So with all these species of pests that we deal with, they're going to lay eggs with a certain window that are triggered by temperatures or whatever. And if you planting coincides with that egg laying or whatever, that's when you're going to have some big problems. So what they recommended was if you live in the southern states like us, plant as early as you can. Mm -hmm. Maybe even take some risk like I did and plant early and you'll get ahead of that egg laying window. If you live in the northern states, they recommend actually waiting a little bit to plant after they've already laid their eggs, that way they ain't laid them on your squash plants. So uh, knowing what that specific window is for your area could be a little bit tricky, but if you're in the south, plant as early as you can. If you're in the north, you can wait and plant a little bit later. I don't know if this is the case with us, why we don't have a big of an issue with this, but it would make sense. Maybe that early planting uh, we get in and then they lay the eggs at some point between our first and second planting and we maybe we kind of miss them because we use a succession plant. We do and we don't have a big of a problem with them. I think it's, a, I think we keep a pretty good clean, a pretty good clean, a clean garden. Also, we do a lot of cover cropping as far as keeping the soils healthy. I think it has a huge, huge impact on them. Rotation is going to help with these a lot. Make sure you don't plant squash, cucurbits in the same place year after year after year. Now these adults, they can travel up to a mile. So if your garden plots are close, rotation, it's going to help, but it's not going to completely eliminate your problem. It is recommended, I read out there, if you have really bad issues these year over year, you should maybe should consider not planting any cucurbits or squash for a year giving them a break so they don't have grounds for reproducing. Now something that I've never done a lot of, but I have seen and heard a lot of people do a lot of what they call trapping. Mm -hmm. And that's when they'll plant a hubbard. That ain't like trapping a raccoon. That ain't trapping a raccoon or rabbit. But they'll do a they'll do a planting of a hubbard squash as kind of they just kind of give it up and let the insects have it. And the, they'll move over there to that and give them some relief on the squash that they're growing. 
Yeah, and I've heard that that works. I still have trouble wrapping my head around, okay, I'm going to let the population boom over here. And it seems like you would have to deal with that at some point. You know, I've heard some people say they had good re results. No, I have too. I, I've never tried it uh, personally. It's kind of I'm hard. It's hard for me to go through the go through the method of planting a whole row of something, knowing I'm going to give it up. That's what's hard on me. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Now, with all these IPM strategies, we list things, biological controls, controls without having to spray, and then. You know, last resort is to actually spray or treat from. I didn't mention row cover, and I don't think I put row cover on the list, but row cover is always an option for IPM for any of these crops. Most people aren't using row cover on their squash, but you can if sure. you grow in a high tone or whatever. So what are the chemicals that you can use on these guys? Well, if you want to go the organic route, then you want to use something like spinosad here. Our spinosad started coming in these little green jugs. Mm -hmm. most of the the dead giveaways that down at the bottom of your fingers got covered up where it says spinosad. Right there, yeah. You know, some people pronounce that differently. Spinosad. Spinosad. Some people say spinosad. We spinosad. say spinosad. Yeah. It's a southern thing. Spinosad. Anyway, so your spinosad there is going to be your organic control. Uh, you want to start spraying that early. Uh, you want to get those larva before they bore into the plants. So you, you, you're spraying frequently, trying to kill them between hatching and actually boring into the plants is your goal there. The non-organic option, the kind of last resort if you just got bad problems or you know you're gonna have a bad problem would be a pyrethroid like we mentioned earlier with this Bug Buster 2 here. So those are squash vine borers. Lots of different things you can do. You're probably never going to get rid of them permanently, but lots of things you can do to um, reduce your pressure on those guys. I think Next planting one, early is, is, is... Oh, it is. It's important. Next one is squash bugs. And you know what? We probably have more people complain that they have issues with squash bug than any other insect that I'm aware of. You think so? I think I, so. I, I'd say it's pretty close between vine borer and squash bug. I personally... I have a lot of issues with squash bugs. I do too. And are you talking about something that we're keeping a clean garden and when that plant gets through getting it out of the ground, it's going to make a huge difference. This is it. Good housekeeping in the garden is going to help you dramatically on the squash bug. Now, it's another tough one to control once it goes to that nip stage and gets to the adult stage. And I think that's one reason they can get out of hand so quick. I think that's one of the issues people have so much problem with them is they, they the populations build up and they explode before you know it, and once they get there, they're hard to control. That's right. So how do you get squash bugs? Well, they come from eggs being overwintered somewhere, whether that be in your soil, whether that be in a leaf pile beside your garden, a mulch pile. Fence row. Yeah, any, in my case, the probably them pine trees that are planted mm -hmm. right, that little forest planted right behind my house. Those eggs are somewhere near your garden or in your garden. They hatch, they make adults. Those, excuse me, those adults lay eggs and you can just start having problems. Um, you know if you've got squash bugs, because you can go out there and see these little copper colored squash bug eggs on your leaves. Uh, you can see them in little clusters there. You know you got them. Now you can hand remove these with duct tape. I showed a video trick yeah. for that. Uh, yeah. If you just got a few plants, that's not a bad option. And then once those eggs hatch, they turn into these little kind of silver colored nymphs and that's when you really need to kill them. That's the mean looking suckers right there. Yep, yep. That's when you want to get them. That's when they are easiest to get. But once they grow into that reproductive adult, and um, which we'll put a picture on the screen here of what an adult squash bug looks like for those of you who have luckily never seen one. Once they turn into a reproductive adult, they are kind of hard to kill. I've heard of folks using dish soap on them, spraying dish soap on them. I, that don't work with my population. I have tried it and tried it, and they just laugh at me. Once you get to that stage, you got to go to the nuke method, nuke method. And, and, and then hope for the best of that because they are tough. So as opposed to squash vine borer where it's the larva doing the damage with the squash bug, it is the adult doing the damage. And they have a piercing mouth part that basically suck the sap uh, out of the plant. And it resembles kind of bacterial wilt. It can happen pretty fast. And once, once they've done their damage, there's really no coming back from it. The control is very similar to what you would use with a vine borer. Row covers. Cover them up and exclude them out of there. Also, you can use some pesticide products just like you could with vine borer. 
Yep, sanitation is going to be important. Removing old crop debris, trying to get those eggs out of, away from your garden as much as possible. Tillage actually will disturb those eggs and help some too. Um, you can't. It's hard to trellis summer squash, but your other cucurbits like um, you do small melons, cucumbers, anything that keeps the foliage off the ground is going to help. Um, so trellis crops that can be trellis when you can. If you all, you've ever seen squash bug damage, they're right there at the base of the plant a lot of times. As far as the chemical treatments for them, we have um, three really. You can The first one would be your oil-based insecticide, something like your neem oil, your hort oil, stuff like that. Yeah, right there's neem oil. Before it gets too hot, you can use these oil-based things, and these work really good at killing those squash bug nymphs. Not gonna do a whole lot for you on the adults. But what you're trying to do is break the cycle here. So you're trying to keep those nymphs from becoming reproductive adults and, and creating this little vicious cycle. So the neem oil will work early on before it gets too hot. And then another organic option would be a pyrethrin, like our yep. Bug Buster O here. So that's your organic option in addition to the neem oil to take care of them. They're getting the same exact mode of action except this one's, the next one we're talking about is going to have residual to it. Well, that one there, you have to get it on them for it to kill them and it has no residual. Right. And then if you have to go the conventional route, then the Bug Buster 2 here, which is the pyrethroid. So pyrethrin, which is organic, derived from the chrysanthemum plant. You got pyrethroid, which is the conventional synthetic formulation. That mimics the action of the pyrethrin. And if, di if you've got populations of squash bugs where dish soap works, go for it. Go for it, you know. Yeah, how about it? Everybody's Nothing else, you got clean squash bugs when you get to <laughs> All right, the next one I have a lot of problem with on tomatoes. Tomatoes and peppers, and this one is called the leaf-footed bug. Now, a lot of people will mistake this for a squash bug, but this one's pretty easy to identify. We'll throw a picture of the adult leaf-footed bug on the screen, and on their back hind legs, they got these kind of little leafy structures there. Pretty easy to identify once you know what you're looking for there. These always damage my tomatoes some. If you ever get that little spottiness, blotchiness on the bottom, mm -hmm. it's from some of this damage right here. Now these leaf-footed bugs, they have piercing mouth parts too, like the squash bugs, but the damage to the plant is not ever really noticeable. It's not really significant. Where they do their damage is on the fruits. Mm -hmm. Now I read one website that said these aren't a problem at home gardeners because they just create blemishes on the fruits. It's not a big, really big deal but they will get my tomatoes to the point where they ain't worth bringing in the house. Yeah, I had to throw a few away. Now I can understand that point, you can still eat them, they're still fine, but it does cosmetically mess them up. And they'll actually gnarl up a little bit at the bottom if you get a bunch of them on there. That's a word for you to write down there, gnarl, <laughs> gnarl up a little bit. But uh, they can cause some pretty good damage. And it's a hard one to control also. Yeah, and this is one of those ones, of course, it, it, by the time they get real bad, we're getting toward the end of our tomato window anyway but you can definitely see them buzzing around out there. Um, do we got a picture? Yeah, we got a picture of the nymphs of what those look like. They almost look like little red ants out there. If you see some of those crawling on your leaves, you best be spraying for them or else you're gonna have a population of hungry adults pretty soon. So how to treat these guys. As always, sanitation. Sanitation yep. is very important. Um, if you use mulch in your garden, most of these pests can overwintered the squash vine borer, your squash bug, and this guy. If you're using permanent mulch in your garden, wood chips, straw, something like that, that is not necessarily the best thing for these guys because your egg's gonna be overwintering in there. And as soon as it's warm enough, come spring, summer, they're gonna be hatching, you're gonna have lots of problems. So in that sense, mulch isn't that great. You wanna move the mulch out of the garden even cultivate the garden a little bit to disturb those overwintering eggs. Rotation cover crops also is extremely important, just like it is with those other pests there. And as far as chemical treatments goes for these guys, um, kind of the same thing as we mentioned for the squash bug, your oils, your neem oil, and then also your pyrethrin here is gonna work on the nymphs. These guys won't kill the adults. They will kill the nymphs. So if you've, if you've got a good regular spraying program and you can catch that window when those eggs are hatching, you can do some damage with either of these here. 
If you got a full blown adult problem, this is the only one we carry that will kill the adults, the Bug Buster 2 or the Pyrethroid. Next one's Pickle Worm. Now we got a lot of people with Pickle Worm problems and I'll be honest with you, I've had my outbreaks of them too. I have Pickle Worms. You know, Pickle Worms, especially if you're growing on the ground, can be an issue and it seems to be worse on those plants that take longer to mature. Gourds or some of these winter squash to me have a larger problem with those and I do short term crops. Yeah, I always thought it was the same thing, but uh, I became educated on this as I was doing some research for the show. There's actually a pickle worm and a melon worm. Uh, so there's two different species there. I've always just called it all pickle worm, but there's actually a melon worm. But for the sake of what we're talking about, the, the treatment and the IPM is pretty much the same. Now what's interesting, what I didn't know, is that the pickle worm can only overwinter in really, really hot areas. Hmm. So they said it doesn't even overwinter here, the eggs don't. In, it's in South and Central Florida and South Texas is where it's hot enough for them to overwinter. Wow. So let me throw a picture on the screen of what the moth looks like, what the adult looks like. And uh, so in areas South Central Texas, excuse me, South Texas, South Central Florida, where this thing can overwinter, when these eggs hatch, you're going to have a problem immediately there in those areas. What happens is once these things become moths, they start migrating north. And then, you know. The cycle begins. We'll have problems. Folks north of us will have problems. Seems like pickle worms aren't really regional. Seems like a lot of people have issues with them. So they, they overwinter in the warmer states and then start flying north. And then they start laying the eggs. And out of the eggs hatch these little green looking caterpillars and that's what does the damage now when these little caterpillars are small they may mainly damage the blossoms they aren't strong enough big enough to get inside the fruit once they grow a little bit then they'll start getting inside your fruit your cucumbers your squash all that now one thing i've noticed especially on cucumbers and gourds and things like that that will help is growing on a trellis Seems to help a lot getting those fruits off the ground. You don't have near the problem. If you anticipate having a problem, if you had a problem in the past, maybe a strategy you want to incorporate is get them up off the ground with some trellising form that you may have, whether it be cow panel or holding over netting or something like that. As far as the IPM for these guys go, big one is going to be planting early. Planting early before they make their migration your way. Um, get your cucumbers in early. Now these things won't like destroy uh, destroy the plants like some of these other pests will. They're just aggravating. You go and pick your bucket of cucumbers, you take them inside, wash them, and then you lay them out on the counter and all of a sudden you just see holes all in them and little worms crawling out of them. It can be frustrating. I've had that same, very same thing happen to me a few times. You just like you got this prize squash and you go looking around on it's got little holes in it. That's right. So you want to plant early and also if you get a problem, how to get, I have got or had a problem with pickle worms and been able to kind of get rid of it. You basically pick early and often. So if you get a pickle worm issue, don't wait till those cucumbers get to what you want to be the right size. Go through there, pick them clean. Just pick them clean, throw away the bad ones and start your regular spraying program. Sanitation is going to be important in areas where they can overwinter. They're pretty easy to spray for and control once you get your, uh, Get kind of wrapped around it there. What do we got? We got BT. BT. It's been a sad. It's been a sad again. So with this one, you can control these pretty easily with organic methods. You've got your BT right here, which is also going to work great for your tomato horn worms, stuff like that. So BT works great for pickle worms. And then you've got your spinosad again, which is organic as well. You could mix these two together, but I would do a rotation with them. Yeah, yeah. I like to use BT one week, spinosad the That's next what I week. Would do. With the spinosad, just make sure you spray it late in the evenings so you don't bother your bees on that one. Yeah. Well, all the insecticides, with the exception of BT, holds that same caution. Spray late or early, protect those pollinators. BT really doesn't matter, but the other ones, it will make a difference. Now this last one is one that is not regional to us. We don't really ever have an issue with it. I have had. You have? I have had. Yes, oh, I have. Yeah. I've never had an issue with it. Yep, and most of the ago. stuff you read, they say they're more problematic than northern states. But uh, I stand corrected then. They've been a few years, but I've had, a, <coughs> I've had outbreaks so bad I've had to treat for them before. Now back in the day, 
The treatment was all a standard treatment. You take seven dust, put it in a pantyhose. You got your pantyhose from your wife or your grandma or whatever. It's going to get your pantyhose, what, how big it were. But anyway, and you would put your seven dust down in them and you would walk out there and you would dust those plants with that seven dust. Mm -hmm. And you'd get it all over you and everything else. But it yeah, wasn't. wearing some pantyhose. We're, and wearing some pantyhose. Extremely effective against potato beetle seven dust tips. The problem was, I don't know if there's another chemical out there that is more toxic to a bee or a wasp or any type of a pollinator. Uh, any type of, well, I ain't gonna say any type of pollinator, but any kind of bee, honeybees, especially honeybee. I don't know if there's anything out there more toxic to them than seven is. It's yeah. at the top of the list. So we was really rough on our pollinators, and we either didn't know we didn't we didn't know any better, we didn't care. But that's the way all the old people used to treat for them. Now you, now you're, now, now you're, they've you're, evolved. Now and you're I woke. know, I know, I know better. Now you're woke. Yep. Uh, <coughs> so what these, we'll put a picture on the screen of the. the Can you just visualize me with a pantyhose? Yeah. Shaking. Man, boy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully we did go take a shower after y'all got it all over. Well, you may or you may not. You didn't think nothing about it. I mean, you didn't know no better. Right. So we'll throw a picture on the screen of the adult Colorado potato beetle, and we hear a lot about people having problems with these. If you do some research on the IPM for these, a lot of the articles that are out there are from universities up north. Minnesota has a lot of studies on them. They seem to have a little more problem with them up north, Maine, um, up there. What they do is they basically just attack the foliage of the plant. They're going to interfere with the photosynthesis. The adult... They're going to gnaw little holes in everything. Most of the time, a light infestation is a lot, a lot to worry about. You can probably even get by if you just got a light infestation of them. It's just kind of move on. But you do need to keep eye on it. They can get out of hand, and when they get out of hand, you got to do something quick. There are some beneficials that can, predatory insects that can take care of these guys. And there are some of those with these other pests we mentioned as well. That's a whole nother box to get into as far as turning loose different predatory insects and beneficials, but those are, that is a, a IPM solution as well. With this, um, I'm gonna speak specifically for our neighbors to the north, how you can alleviate your pressure here. One, reason, one way to do it is to plant early and plant early maturing varieties. Your red taters, your things are gonna finish out fast. So if you plant early, excuse me, plant early maturing varieties early, you get your taters out of there before these guys come in and really do a lot of damage. On the other hand, I also saw some recommendations that said to plant late. So you basically mm. miss the window. These things are coming in kind of at one time. They look and feed, do some damage. But if they don't find anything, they're probably going to go to neighbor's yard somewhere else. So you can plant really early and plant an early maturing tater or wait a little bit. Because if you're up north, you got a moderate summer anyway. It's not like us where we got to get them in. Right. Um, you can plant later, and they've already came and gone. So I thought that was interesting. This is one where they do recommend mulch as a way to help with the insect pressure because it says it reduces the infestation, makes it harder for the... I just can't imagine mulching my potatoes. I've never done that. Uh-uh. But they say it keeps them... It makes it harder for them to get to the plants. I understand That's that. That's interesting. Rotation... Sanitation, of course, is going to be important here. Uh, removing old crop debris. You always want to rotate your potatoes, not just insect problems, but for disease problems specifically. And then as far as treating them, uh, there is a good organic control for them, and that would be the spinosad here. The old mighty spinosad. Yeah. So spinosad is, uh, can take care of a lot of problems in your garden. Just make sure you spray it responsibly late in the evenings. So... We didn't cover every single pest out there. We just did squash vine borer, squash bug, leaf-footed bud, pickle worm, yep. Colorado potato beetle. Yep. We, we could spend all day on this. What I want you to understand is, is you got to understand the kind of whole problem with the pest. It can't just be a trigger. What can I spray right now to get rid of it? Because that's not going to really solve your problem. You could be doing things that are making your problem worse that you don't even know. I've seen applications of pesticides before they actually made the problem worse. If you time that right so that your beneficials are at a peak or fixing the peak and you spray something in there, you could actually do more damage you could good. That's right. So if you have any other pests that you want to know all this information on, like I said, all you have to Google, just type it in Google, whatever that pest name is, and you can type IPM or Integrated Pest Management, and you'll see at least three or four articles come up 
lots of good information. Most of them will tell you um, all the sanitation practice, beneficial insect practice, and also what you can spray for last resort. Basically what it means is a well-rounded strategy for pest control. Not only spraying, but other things as well. That's right. All right, let's get in some questions from last week's show. All right, first one is from Patriot Pop, and he says, my first live broadcast with Hall's tools in your 30 by 30 garden areas, do you consider cross-pollination between tomato plants? If one plants non-heirloom seeds, which results in some franken plant, how do we see producers successfully plant and grow them? Well, most of your... Uh Seed producers are doing hand pollination. Um, that's why hybrid seeds tend to cost a lot more. They just cost a lot more to make. I don't ever really consider cross pollination with tomatoes. I plant lots of different tomato varieties in the same row. If you're saving seeds and growing one heirloom beside another, there might be something to worry about there. Tomatoes are self pollinating, so it's not like squash and cucumbers, but if a bee's out there feeding on the flowers, he could accidentally transfer some pollen from one variety to the next. There's a chance of that happening. If you're not saving your seeds, there's nothing to worry about. If you are saving your seeds, you might want to give a little bit of isolation per these heirloom varieties. You're not going to save the hybrid seeds anyway. But for the heirlooms, you might want to give yourself a little bit of space. But I would say for the most part, this is not something most people worry about. I never worry about it. Number two is from Israel Najjar, and he says, do the drip emitters ever clog? And if it does, how do you fix it? It is possible they clog. And I can honestly say, I don't think I have ever had one clog up, but they do recommend to flush the lines about every two weeks out. And on our drip uh, tape on the end of it has this nice little thing that you can unfold real easily, pop them out, turn your water on, flush the ends out, and then put them back on there. I, have you ever had a problem? I've never had a problem. Although the big farmers, commercial guys do flush them from time to time. They do use some chemicals in there, some acids in there that can uh, help with that. And flush your main line as well. You flush, but I've never had a problem. Can they clog up? Yes, never had a problem with it. Yeah, me either. Next one is from Thomas Sims. He says, have you ever tried growing a double row of corn on a single drip tape line or is that not enough space? I've never tried it. I have tried growing it two foot apart, but I did see somebody on a row by row group on Facebook doing this today and it looked like it worked fine. So instead of planting his corn rows 30 inches or 36 inches apart on his drip tape line, because he was limited on space, he basically did a double row, skipped over two or three feet, did another double row. I can't remember how many double rows he had, but it looked like it would work perfect. If you were limited on space, you could certainly do that. Uh, just go off the sides of uh, the tape, I'd say three or four inches or so. Yeah, and, uh, yeah it will work. It, it looked, well, his plot looked mighty pretty. It's not something I want to do, but I think it'd work. Kind of stuck to my old ways on them 30, 36 inch rows. Yeah. Number four is from, uh, my notes here messed up. Oh, yeah, you share mine. It's from Chris Kearns, and he wants to know if you'll share your DE milkshake recipe, please. Well, I reckon I might would. So this right here is our product that we sell, and we call it DE. What does DE stand for? Diatomaceous, sir. Which is? Um, I'll give you some school in there, ain't it? It's from diatoms. Diatoms. Silica from diatoms. Well, the one we sell is a food grade. So you could put this food grade in with your animal feed. A lot of people put it in with your chicken feed, too. It helps with parasites with your animals. But now also... Humans can drink this right here, and yeah, I told y'all. I told y'all a couple of weeks ago that I had drank some before, and y'all think nobody believed it, so I thought I'd do it on the show. Now the recipe for this is one of these small spoons. They tell me that's a teaspoon. I've always got my spoon sizes messed up. They tell that me that ain't a teaspoon. That's is not it? a. Yes, it is. That looks like a big spoon. That's a little spoon. Okay. So you take one little spoon of this right here per day. Get you daily. Heap, heap it up right there and put it in there and you want to wall it up good. You should have brought a clear cup. Well, I couldn't find one. It's going to be a little, little nasty looking. Then you stir it up good and you drink it. Now, what I had read this is good for is good for high blood pressure, low blood pressure, diabetes, uh, sinful thoughts, irritability, irritability uh, glaucoma, uh, a little bit of everything. 
So I have drank some before and I thought I would share it with you again. I didn't bring you a glass. You gonna drink? You do it like you do your Metamiso, you just go and drink it all Yeah, time. it ain't real pleasant. So you pretty much have to get it on down. It's a little chalky. It's a little chalky, it don't have much flavor to it, but it, it's so good for you. <laughs> you, got, you got to drink a whole glass at a time. I'm sure there's a, a minimal amount of water to dissolve that. Yeah, we're going to stir it up a little bit more. It kind of settles out on the bottom, so you have to keep it stirred up. Well, I'm going to feel good when I get through this. <laughs> I, sure, I sure hope so. That looks painful. Mm. You about got knocked out? A little gritty taste in my mouth. You know what I mean? Like you ever eat something, had a little dirt on there? You're going to be a spring chicken, though, by yeah. the time this is over with, ain't you? It does settle out bad, see there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyhow, you, I've done that. I'm through with I it now. I think you nourish now. Yeah. You feel Wait. better already. One teaspoon per day. That was pretty heaping. Maybe Maybe not quite so much. I do feel good, though. <laughs> All right, what's the next one? You still got a question or two. Yes, we do. Brian Oster, Oster I, I can't even pronounce it after all that. Yeah. What is the best way to water your sweet potatoes, Travis? So the, I have not done sweet potatoes on drip. I have done them on drip. Um, I did notice last year the survival of my slips, considering we, well, I like to wait until it's good and hot to plant mine. My slip survival is better when I use drip. Now, I don't bury it and plant on top of them. What I did... I lay my tape on top of the soil. I put my slips in beside the tape on the surface, and then I come in there and heal them afterwards, and then that covers the tape. Um, I don't like, the same reason I don't use it on Irish potatoes, I don't like that tape and a lot of moisture down there where my taters or root crops are because it can make them rot a little bit. So that's the way I did it. I've overhead watered plenty of times too, but I've also lost some slips when it's been too hot and I couldn't get water on quick enough. So I like the... Uh, um, I like using the drip, get a little better slip survival there. Slip survival. Last one is from Nelson Cobbs, and uh, he says this might be off the subject. When you heal your potatoes for the first time, which I got to do very soon, you mentioned you side dress with 20-20-20. How do you apply it, water can or sprayer? Well, I don't use drip irrigation on my potatoes most of the time, and I did this year, and I just happened to heal my potatoes for the first time yesterday a little bit. So this is what I do. I take my two gallon sprayer. I put me four ounces of 20-20-20 in there and I mix it up good. That's a cup, right? And I take my, my uh, it's a half cup, I believe. Eight ounces in a cup. And it has four ounces of water yeah, that's used. Right. Half and then you take your nozzle off and I go down beside of it. Now I don't get it on the plant, but I go down beside of my shoot me a stream on each side as a nice little trotty walk. You know what a trotty walk is. That's when you get moving pretty good. And I just shoot it down both sides, put some micro boost in there and make it even sweeter. Go down one side, back up to the other side, and then I heal to it. It's a nice, easy process. Get them taters fertilized and healed at the same time and get them off of booking. Do you do it prior to healing? I do it prior to healing because I like to cover it up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think feel I'm good. Mm. Feel real good. I feel real good. All right. Hope everybody uh, enjoyed that. And if you have any additional questions, as always, put those in the comments below and we'll be glad to try to answer them for you. We'll put some links below to all the products we talked about on tonight's video. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and ring that little bell so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy this one, make sure you check out these other two pest control videos right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time.